Yo, hello, uh, hello from me too. <laughs> Sorry about that. So, um, I talk a little bit about automation, um, infrastructure as a code. Uh, mainly, I will show the tools Terraform, Packer, and Ansible. Uh, first of all, who's me? I'm, I'm Stöps. I'm with Linux for ages. Who is born bef uh, after 1994? Uh, <laughs> oh, <dear. laughs> Who knows? Yeah. So, yeah, it's long. So, um, I work mainly with application servers, but uh, since a year or so, I do more and more DevOps, Docker stuff, and so on. I love Vim. Uh, and never got into Emacs, so I stay with it. Uh, I like Tetshell, like Lyra, so let's start. Uh, no, I, I want to greet and thank some guys. So I want to greet, uh, greet my family, which is very... Um, I, I, I hope they sit at home and watch the live stream. Thanks, girls, for supporting me. Uh, thanks for the organizing team of the Gulasch Programmiernacht. It's a great event. I'm a first-timer here. So, but now let's start. So, my history. Um, I started in the last century as an administrator, uh, mainly with bare metal uh, servers. So, really hard stuff with special weight. We had special shoes to run to all to our servers. We have to, had to update them. When we want, wanted to, to get a new application, we always had to order new servers or new metal and deploy on these machines. Network was slow, so mostly the servers were, were in-house, so we traveled all around the town and watched our servers. Uh, then we started with um, virtualization. I think we started with VMware shortly after 2000. Um, that was the first time where we could deploy stuff without ordering um, hardware. Quite, quite nice, um, but we still worked like before. So provisioning, deployment, uh, still everything was manual. Um, so a little bit easier, but I would say more work because now uh, before we had an operating system with our application and dependencies. Now we have or we had an operating system, a hypervisor, and in each VM uh, operating system which needed uh, updates. So, um, this huge amount of servers when you start with uh, virtualization is named server sprawl in uh, infrastructure as a code. So, the, the count of servers um, made it impossible to de deploy all patches all around the network. So, most of the time we only deployed high security risk or if a special application needed a special fix. So, like a new Java version for Jira application server or something like that. Um, or there was a new zero-day uh, exploit, so we deployed the fix. When we look on the other side, we were two administrators. We mainly installed the same software, when, but when two admins install two times or three times the same product, it always looked different. So even if, when you have a good checklist and you hook everything, there will be something different. So latest on the next update, that something will break. Um, th this phenomenon is configuration drift. So how, how did we try to, to solve that? So first I tried to write some scripts, shell scripts, patches, um, silent installation files. Then we started installing application servers with a graphical interface, so we had to document each step, each click has to be uh, packed into a screenshot. I, I, I saw documentation for installing stuff from a company with three characters, which was, I think, 1,000 slides long with uh, 1,200 screenshots or something like that, just to install one product. It was horrible. Uh, when something broke, um, we had nights and nights troubleshooting uh, when we deployed updates on production servers, the behavior was completely different from our tests from test servers. Um, 
what was the reason on the test servers we normally deployed all fixes which were available so we installed fix one two three four and on in production sometimes it happened you install only fix four it's uh, cumulative so fix four should contain all fixes from the fixes before but the behavior was different it was always a crap so these uh, differences which creeped in over time yeah how did they how did that happen so sometimes a database server needed a special fix I, I think Oracle was a, a classical um, product for that the new ticket system needs a new Java version the application server get more traffic so you need a different configuration than the other ones just to handle that traffic um, it's it's no problem. When, you, when we look at infrastructure as a code, this uh, special server configurations are special Snowflake servers. So that's one server with one special configuration. It's not bad, but you need to capture that. You need to, to work around to get that reproducible. So you, you want to install a server, and you want to install it quick when it fails. So you need something to, um, to automate and um, get that server reproduced in a failure. Difference is not bad. Um, you just have to uh, understand what makes that server different and how can I rebuild it. And I think, um, as I said, I, I'm an administrator since I'm 20 years or so. Uh, an operator or administrator team should be confidently and quickly rebuild every server in his infrastructure. Um, The, yeah. I, I think everybody who is in IT for, for several years knows that uh, famous servers. So there is a server under a desk of an old administrator. Don't touch it, don't point, point at it, don't even look at that server, please. Um, I, I think I worked at five or six companies now in, in my history, and there was always one of these special servers on one of these desks. Ages old, Windows NT 3. Point something, um, <laughs> old network cabling, um, you know that stuff. So um, everybody had this. But um, latest, when the hardware breaks, you need someone to, um, rep uh, re to replace that service. Um, but how? Automat uh, Automatic deploy is available since, since years now. There's Chef, there's Puppet. I think Chef is available 10 or 15 years now. Um, but most of the administrators I know use that, team, uh, that tools only to initially deploy a server. Nobody will run that against a server which runs already two or three years. Because uh, maybe there will something break, so don't touch it. No. <laughs> Maybe a colleague was there and did a manual change, so I, I will break it when I run the, the automatic tool. So um, no, nobody wants to do that, or only few of us. Why? So this fear spiral is, why are our servers inconsistent? Because we make changes outside of the autom automation tools. Um, and I'm afraid to run my automation tool. Maybe I break something, and on the other side, the server is inconsistent. So I'm always turning around and around and around. So, so there is a, uh, it's, it's around some years now. The, the infrastructure is a code. When I read the, the wording the first time, mm, I thought, what the fuck? I'm not a developer. So why should I write code? It's just server. Um, but think about it. Uh, our, our virtual environment already is code. There are virtual machines. It's just code. There is a virtual network. There are virtual disks. All definitions are just, it's, it's a little bit of code. And what is code? Code is text. So Python is text. It's just how I interpret it. Interpret, uh, interpret in, uh, you know what I mean. Um, for code, there are tons of tools available to work with it. There are editors, there are version control systems, there are build servers to work with it, um, and our developers work since ages with 
text and code. So um, I think we can handle that too. So the principles of infrastructure as code is um, systems need to be easily reproducible. Systems are disposable, so when something breaks, I can just exchange it. Systems need to be consistent. Processes are repeatable. Um, design is changing, yeah, sure. Um, and our processes should be as um, simple as possible to meet current requirements. I think, um, and when we need a change, it must be able, uh, we must be able to deliver it safely and quickly. So when I look at companies or my company, when I need a virtual machine, it can need some days until I get it. Or I, I have customers where, where I wait weeks for a virtual machine, and I would say when I do that, <laughs> weeks, I, I need six weeks for a firewall rule, so um, <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean. So I would say when you um, think a little bit of, about um, automation with server deployments, you can get a virtual machine in two, two or three minutes. Maybe you can generate a self-service to get a virtual machine for your colleagues. Um, how can we achieve this? We need um, definition files where we can describe our uh, environment. Nobody likes to create documentation, so maybe we can get a process to document everything automatically within our process. So the script generate the uh, documentation too. When we put all our stuff into a version control system like Git, we have a history, so no need to document that too. Um, we can build test and production environment uh, which are completely equal, so we can really test an update. Um, and when we monitor the environment, we can just do that during the night or very easy during the day when everybody is working. We just need to provide a testing that everything works like before. There are two kinds of tools. Um, one kind is immutable tools, the other ki kind is a mutable tool. The immutable uh, ones um, completely replace the server. So when a server needs uh, a new IP address, a new version, a new operating system update, it will be completely replaced. So I have really, when I have a test and a production server, they will be completely equal. Because we learned some slides before, when we update with three or four fixes or with one fix, it will be different. So there we can uh, test a complete update. Because, but when we use an immutable system, we have to think about what, what happens with our data. So maybe in a storage system, but we, we can solve that. But don't forget, there is some data which maybe should be saved before you throw away a server. A good example for immutable is um, containerization, like Docker. They just have an image, they fire up a new uh, container, when the work is done, they throw it away. The other kind is mutable. Mutable is still automatic deployment, um, but they don't replace. So there it can happen that we have a configuration drift. Mutable uh, software is something like Ansible, Puppet, Chef is, is mutable. So there it can happen that production and test is um, behaving different. Think about a server life cycle. There is, I think the first thing what we do when we start with infrastructure as code is building a template. So we start building a, a small kind of server which we can clone. From the template we create the server. A server needs to be maybe update it, sometimes I can delete it, sometimes I have to replace the server. That's uh, five, uh, five kinds of server tasks I normally work with. So, which tools do we use today? Um, first of all, some of the code is really simplified, so it's, it's not that secure. When you want to do that in production, please have a look at that. I will show some clear text passwords. I wouldn't do that in production, but we have only an hour, so um, we need to do that a little bit quicker. Uh, it will run on a normal VM workstation. I use uh, a vSphere cluster to deploy the stuff. I use Packer, Terraform, and Ansible to get everything running, so not that hard. And um, yeah, VMware needs a license. The other three tools um, are free. 
It should work on a Mac too. I haven't tested it. So just it's years ago that I used the Mac, so I don't know. Uh, the, all, all files are stored in a Git repository. There's the link. The link will be in the end of the talk. So just grab it there. Um, I think that's pretty much all here. Um, some dependencies. When we use Terraform to provision a template, we need to have the, the open VMware tools and Perl installed in the template. Uh, we need a connection with SSH, and Ansible for the later customizations needs a Python, Python 2.7 or 3. So we have to put it in front in, in our template, or it will not run in the end. Um, in my Packer template, I use a temporary password, which is named password, but I disable the login in the end of the process, so I, I hope that's secure in the moment. Uh, but when you use that in production, please don't forget to remove or change the password. So what's Packer? Packer is from HashiCorp. HashiCorp maybe is known from, um, they have several tools for automation. Um, Vagrant. I think they started with Vagrant, now they use Packer and um, Terraform. Uh, Packer is licensed under a Mozilla license, so I think it's, it's open source, it's easy to install, it's just a download of a binary and put it in your path. Um, and there are hundreds of templates uh, on GitHub and GitLab to deploy Windows servers, clients, or Linux machines. So you can find nearly everything. Um, I will do a CentOS deployment here. So that's all builders Packer can use. So you can do nearly every cloud template, Docker templates, Kubernetes, VirtualBox, VMware, KVM, LXD, Hyper-V, who, who wants just a file. So that's pretty much all. You can provision each template with standard shell, local shells, Windows shell, PowerShell, Puppet, Chef, yeah, that's pretty much all, and Ansible. And as a post-processor, you can just upload it on a Docker registry to a cloud provider, on a vSphere machine, on a vSphere cluster. Uh, VMware ESX, I think so, is there, or Vagrant. So a, a ton of tools. How to do that? First of all, I created a kickstart file. So that's Standard, we can use Kickstart files to deploy Red Hat or CentOS, uh, I think, since 3.0 or so. I started with 3.0, I, I would say, yeah, since 3.0. Uh, the only thing I s changed here from the standard Kickstart is I changed the keyboard to German and the time zone. Everything else is just there's a swap partition. And um, one thing here is a encrypted password. That's password encrypted as SHA-256. Um, so you can put here your password, and um, even when you put that onto Git, it should be safe. Um, so we will start our deployment with that Kickstart script. How is the deployment of, uh, or how do we build the Packer template now? The, the, the builder is we use VMware ISO, and the most important one here is we want to boot with our Kickstart script. So the Packer script will type in the Kickstart script during the boot process. We communicate with SSH. The guest OS is sent to a 764-bit. Um, we use a minimal ISO file. We have the... Um, the, 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 the hash for the, the ISO file as a download too. And we have a, a root user and a password to uh, shut down the machine in the end of the deployment. That's this. Then we want to provision it. After the process of deploying, I start um, some shell commands. Within that shell commands, I install the open VM, uh, yeah, the open VM tools. I tweak a little bit of the SSH service. Um, I reboot the machine. I do an update, a kernel update to 5.1, because normally the CentOS machine is coming with a 3.1 uh, kernel. So that's just everything in the template. And I install 
OpenVM tools, Perl and Python. So when the template is finished, I can work further with um, Terraform and Ansible. Here's an example of one of the scripts at the bottom of the slide. Um, so it's just a, a yum, install OpenVM tools, install Perl, and then restart the VM tools uh, service. That's pretty much all. It's important that the Pekka uh, template restarts one time because the vSphere cluster won't recognize the OpenVM tools without that reboot. Now that's a little bit, to th uh, that's something to think about. Then the post processor, in the end, I just upload the result of my template process to the vSphere cluster. So I need a, a server name, a cluster name, the disk where it's stored, and then it starts the update. The username is fake, and there is no password. Yeah, OK. And in the end, I showed we use builders, provisioners, and post processors. It's one file, it's a JSON file. Just copy the three slides together or use the GitHub uh, file. And then we can run the Pekka command. First of all, validate it. And there is an error. The build command is not validate, it's build. And all variables we use within our uh, JSON file can be set on the console. So um, I set my vSphere password on the console. I use a timestamp for my template name that I know when I build that template. Uh, and, and that's pretty much all. And I hope. Yeah, that, that's all. Uh, I used, where is it? Here? No. There. We used just one, um, one disk. So I, I, I haven't changed anything in the default settings. The, the VMware will build on a, I think, 40 uh, gigabyte um, single hard disk. Uh, but we can change that with Terraform later during that process. Um, the so that's, I, th I think that's a minimum to start with Terraform and Ansible with that template. So what happens here? I hope you can see that. Too, too, too small, huh? So it's Packer build. I, I already said normally the, the Packer is uh, executable. You download from the HashiCorp uh, page on Fedora. You have to rename it to Packer something because there already is a tool named Packer. So I name it normally Pekka IO. So you see, I start the build process. On the right side, you see uh, my VMware workstation starting up. You can start that headless that you don't see that process, but I want to show that here. And uh, that was too quick. So let's start again. So there's the download. Normally, when the ISO file is already in the uh, cache directory, it, it will not download. And here you see that the process will type in our kickstart file. So it gets the IP address of the machine. It says you get your kickstart file with HTTP of the um, host, and then fire up the deployment of the server. And let's speed that up a little bit. So that's a kickstart installation. And now on the left side, you see uh, the deployment with the shell scripts. So all updates will, uh, are deployed. Um, in the end of the deployment, I, I run a cleanup uh, to remove all temporary files, to remove the repository cache, to remove the SSHD host keys. Because when you don't remove the host keys, all of your virtual machine will, ha will have the same SSHD host keys. So not that secure. And in the end, so that's the final process. It uploads now to the vSphere server. That's a process, I, I would say that's 15 minutes. And you have a already installed um, Linux something. And you could, can do the same with, with Windows. So you can create all templates you, you like. Everything is on GitHub. So that's a Packer build. Now we have a new template on our VMware machine or our VMware server. Now let's go to Terraform. Terraform is also from HashiCorp. It's also Mozilla public licensed. Um, and like Packer, just download, unzip, and put it on the, into the path. Mm. So. Terraform knows around 160 
uh, providers. I hope I can show them. Build it. No, that's Pecker. So it's a, it's a long list. I don't copy it. Um, you can do nearly everything. You can use OpenStack as a, a target. You can use a Kubernetes GitHub. Um, there are plugins for monitoring systems like I, I think, uh, uh, Grafana, Prometheus. So you can do really everything during the deployment. So even uh, register a new DNS name, um, configure the virtual network, uh, upload to a cloud provider, and so on. So it's not limited to VMware. You can do everything. So. Here's an example we use, and it's on the Git repository too. Uh, Terraform has its own configuration language, it's HCL. Uh, it's, it looks nearly like, um, I would say, YAML. It's, it's a little bit different. Um, it's, it's a mix of YAML and, and, and JSON, um, but it's not that hard. I have. Uh, a build Terraform file where I normally store the information of uh, the systems I want to deploy to, so my cloud provider or my VMware environment. The GPN 19 server 1 and 2 are two server definitions. We will generate two servers. Um, the dot .terraform file is just a, a plan. Ignore it. The dot .terraform are the plugins. When you just have the TF files and do a Terraform in it, uh, Terraform downloads all plugins which it needs to deploy the stuff. The TF state files will appear when the first deployments are ready. So when I deploy something with Terraform, um, the, the state is stored with in a Terraform TF state file. And in the end, I have a, a variable file where I provide some information about the environment, like um, DNS domain, passwords, and something like that. And a version Terraform file, there is the version where you define that stuff. So it's looking like that. So that's our variable definition. We have our vSphere uh, server name. We have our uh, vSphere user and password and data center and so on. And I think we have a look at it live. Is, is that big enough? So readable from, yeah. Um, Let's start with the build one. So, um, provider, vSphere, project folder, which data center, so that's all um, VMware stuff, network, in which folder will it be deployed. So, that's the first things, then um, the variables, DNS server, string list, so that's my DNS server, what's my admin password to get to it with SSH, which template name, and my SSH public key that I can um, work with Ansible and that machines. That's this, and half an hour. VM. GPN server one. So that server definition itself. So the server name in line one, um, which pool that's a variable, four cores, four gigabyte of RAM. Uh, we have a 100 gigabyte disk. Um, that's the IP address, net a gateway, our provisioner. With that provisioner, I just deploy my uh, SSH public key into the, to the root user that I can work with Ansible and that account. And in the end, because we created a template with Pekka where the password was password, um, I lock the, the root account with lock. Um, so nobody can log in with the password, but we can still log in with an SSH key. That's all. So. That's this. So we saw that, we saw this. That's the main commands. Um, 
When we are ready with our uh, environment and our Terraform files, we do a Terraform plan. We can set some variables there, like our vSphere password, like the template name, so we can use it in a build pipeline and uh, needn't change anything in the file itself. Um, it generates a plan file. In that case, the name is rebuild Terraform. And when we run uh, Terraform apply, uh, the servers will be generated. Destroy means everything in the definition files will be destroyed, so hardly deleted from VMware. And with Taint, we can just decide which servers will be deleted. So we can say, OK, we def define 10 servers. One of them is a little bit creepy. Um, we can taint that one server, so it's marked for deletion. The next one, uh, next time when we run a Terraform plan, it's marked for deletion, apply, and it will be deleted and automatically uh, new deployed. And we have a fresh installed single server, even when 10 servers were defined. Some videos. I don't want to show any host names and passwords, so that's the reason for the, the videos. Um, that was a Terraform plan. You see here um, the server name, the folder name where it's deployed. Um, the plus means it will be generated or created. Um, it created a output file. And it shows, shows the command to really install or to really create the servers. Now creating. Uh, I speed it up a little bit. I would say that process generating two or let's say 10 Linux machines on a normal VMware cluster will need about two to three minutes. And it's always the same. Two servers needs two, two and a half minutes and 10 servers needs nearly the same. So it's just a parallel task. You see here um, Zetschel Martin, two minutes, 34 seconds. Uh, and the folder and two machines were created. Ready. So now the taint. Is too fast? No. Um, Server 2 was marked as tainted. When I do the, the plan again, it will show me, uh, speed a little bit up, um, one add, one to destroy. So it will destroy my uh, server 2. And in the same task, it will generate a new one. So always check the output of this plan. Question? Why is the second, yeah. why is the second server destroyed? I, uh, marked him, uh, I marked it uh, for uh, deletion with taint. I just said, OK, there, were, there happened something. So maybe an update failed. So I can just say, OK, I taint one server even when I had 10 uh, definition files. So I, I needn't destroy everything in that environment. So like the two servers, I just can say, OK, that one server, please create it again. So taint it for deletion or taint it for recreation. Run the uh, apply again, and then it kick away the old server and create a new one, maybe with a new template, and that's all. That's the main reason, just to, to, to show it here. Uh, I have an application server deployment with LDAP, two database servers, two web servers, um, load balancer, and I would say three or four WebSphere servers in the background. So there are 10 definition files. And sometimes I just to kick away the LDAP or something like that. And so I can say, OK, taint the one server, recreate it, and I can start from the, from the beginning. But the rest of the environment just stays. And the complete destroy, that's the fastest one. I would say um, destroy is a thing of 10 or 15 seconds. Type in yes. So it shows us three things will be destroyed, two servers and the folder. Um, so I'll return now. And now that's fast. OK, 20 seconds. So um, for a deletion of two servers, and that's the same for 10 servers or so too. One thing is um, still there, the folder, because I, I have no clue how I have to create the definition files that the servers are deleted first and then the folder. It always tries first the folder. 
it's missing because there are machines within the folder, so I run it twice and then everything is away. So we created and destroyed two servers on a cluster, I would say, in eight minutes or so. So now I have, think about, I, I deployed it again. So we have two servers on the, on the uh, VMware uh, environment now. Um, now let's start with Ansible. Uh, who uses Ansible already? Ah, it's, a, it's a lot. It's, it's only a small uh, example here, so don't kill me, please. Uh, with Ansible, I have several advantages. I can run it separately against, uh, against the environment, but I can include it to my Terraform files too. So there is a provisioner for, for Ansible uh, there. So when Terraform is ready, it can start um, Ansible. I split that process in my demo environment um, just for testing reasons, because when something fails, it always um, deletes all servers, and so I can just go back to, to something else. Uh, uh, yeah, so why Ansible? I, I like Ansible because it's clientless. I, I don't have to install any, any server. It's just, it's just pure SSH. Um, and I can do everything what I want, uh, but there is no Windows version, so uh, I hope that's no problem. One one thing uh, we always need to to remember when we do um, infrastructure as code or um, automatic server deployments is idempotency. Um, that means when you run a script or process multiple times against the same server, the behavior is not allowed to change. So, um, like when I do an echo of an IP address in the, in the host files and I run that script twice or three times, I will have uh, three entries. So, that's not idempotent. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, the, perfectly. Yeah. No, it's Typo. Really <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He, um, the the comment was that that command is really idempotent because we have only one greater sign, and so the file will be overwritten each time when we start it. So there must be two th two of them. That's right. That's a typo. Mm. Just just a small example. What you have to recognize here. Um, that's a small example for our two servers. So we will see the inventory where we define some server groups. We will see some group variables in the group variable um, folder. I defined two roles, a common role which will be deployed to all of the servers, just an LDAP role where we deploy an open LDAP to one of them. Um, we see some template files with uh, Jinga 2 templates and the site YAML file with the whole definition of the Ansible task. Inventory file, I defined a server group GPN19 and a LDAP, so only on server 2 we will deploy open LDAP. Um, the common tasks will run against both servers. Uh, that's the site YAML, so we see here the, the all group, so hosts all, um, always meant all groups, even when they are not defined, and the hosts group LDAP will um, set the, the role LDAP for deployment install open LDAP here. The variables, I learned that, that some weeks before. Uh, in group variables, the, the all folder uh, contains variables which are used in all roles and all server groups. When you define um, a group name folder under group variables, it's only valid for the group name. So I can have a GPN19 um, group name here, and then we have um, variables which only uh, are valid for that group. Uh, in my example, I put the passwords for LDAP into the variable file. I would say best practice is to use an Ansible vault. Don't use that in production, please. Um, but but we see here we define the, the LDAP domain and the password. And 
we use some templates. Templates are copied from our local machine to the deployment and all used variables like the, the LDAP password uh, variable or the LDAP domain variable here are replaced with the, the real value of our variable file. So copy it to the server, replace the string and run some commands. That's the role, just as an example, but I think that we will look in the real files and Sybil. So in common, uh, first five lines, we disable the firewall service. So the state is stopped. It's not enabled. So even after restart, it's, it's off. I disabled S Linux for uh, testing purposes. For production, I would enable it. I heard that. <laughs> Sometimes. So uh, we change some limits. So um, number of open files, number of processes. We install some additional tools like Unzip and uh, Vim. I update the SSH configuration like I allow X11 forwarding. Um, and in the end, we restart the SSH service. And for the roles, LDAP. And for the LDAP task, we install open LDAP server and client. We en enable the slab D service. We copy the, the Jinga templates. The text parse means that our variables are replaced. Um, we copy the sample configuration. The sample configuration is already on our deployment because it's de installed with the open LDAP server uh, package. So we need the remote source yes uh, command here. So the process will copy machine to machine folder. Then the config script where I start the LDAP service or and configure it. And in the end, I remove the config script we used here because there is the password in it. I just delete it here with that task. So I think that's pretty much all here. But automate, here's a map. So that's example here. We saw that. And when you have installed uh, Kaose with, uh, with um, your Linux machine, uh, Ansible always use the cow. Um, you can disable that with a, a variable in your bash RC or ZHL RC. You see it runs through now. Um, we see what, uh, which server is changed. The uh, limits changes here. Um, VI is installed um, here. It was a little bit fast. And now the open LDAP is installed. The open LDAP task in that case uh, generates a new server with 20 users, 20 passwords. And uh, in the end, I think I restart, and that's all. So that's a deployment of open LDAP with two servers. And only speed up a little bit. So that's normally three minutes. So, benefits. Why do I do that? Because I already said it. Um, all servers are always looking the same. When I need an update, I just generate a new template, run my scripts again, and I have the same environment with all actual patches. So when I want to test something, I build a test environment, test all updates. Maybe I get that data from our production. I can test everything. I can script it. And in the end, I know when I run that against production and I rebuild the production environment, it will run again in the same way like the test environment. Normally, nothing um, should break here. Uh, administrators don't like to create documentation, so the process should document nearly everything itself. Um, it saves a lot of time. Um, yeah, that's pretty much, yeah, I know. Best, best practice. <laughs> I, I would codify everything. Uh, I, I know when I look back to my history, how I installed servers like 
I think my first test environments on VMware, I installed one server, a second one, I configured them nearly the same. Um, sometimes I just cloned the machines and you have to um, adjust settings like IP address, host names, you forget something. M most of the time you have the same MAC addresses when you um, start with that process. Then I started to generate snapshots um, that I can go back when something happens because the process to install was just too slow. Um, I don't do that. A, a snapshot needs a lot of um, disk on my machine, so I normally work on, on that notebook. Um, a, sna a snapshot, when I install application servers, needs gigabytes of, of disk storage, it's slow, I just deploy it again. When I, I think I, I did a, a SAML uh, test environment some weeks ago, eight or ten machines, two Windows, one, six, six Linux, half an hour work and, and the stuff is just working. And in the end, when you are ready, you just throw it away because you know when you need it again in a half an hour of work or one night uh, running and the machines are restored, you have, the, you have the same again. Nothing what I have to copy on, on backup disks or, or something like that. It's in the version control uh, system. I, I can uh, reproduce it. I have a history. It's documented. Uh, it's modular. So when I need f some of the stuff on another machine, I can just reuse it. That's, that's pretty much all. You need to think about uh, some things. Um, I know I often get questions like, why not using the cloud? Uh, the cloud are just servers of other persons. or so. Someone have to install the clouds, and there is nothing against installing the, his own clouds. So, um, when, when I look the last two years, what, what we are doing on with Kubernetes or, or uh, server testing or rollouts, uh, test server deployments, I, I think I, I save fifty percent of my testing time. And on top of that, what I show today. When you register DNS names, monitoring, and um, some testing tasks, it can run automatically out of pipelines. So even it, it, it just tests it itself. Just write it once or test it twice, and then you can automatically run the stuff. And a little bit too fast, so we have time for questions. Awesome. Thank you very much, Steps. Other questions? Yes. When you clone the machines, um, you remove the SSH keys. Yeah. Uh, do you also remove a machine ID and a system ID? Uh, during the cleanup? Yes. Uh, there are several things. The SSH host key, the, the caches, um, some temporary files. Uh, I think I reset the repository fastest counter, so you get the real fastest repositories when you deploy the stuff. Uh, there are several things. The script is in the Git repository. Ch just have a look at it. Further questions? Who's not fragen? Bother him. <laughs> Sir, I have no mana, so that's the reason. No yeah, questions. Yeah, huh? think yeah. about that. <laughs> <laughs> I normally give beer away, but... Uh, too next late time. today. Next yeah, time. Next time. Yes. Just a sec. Yeah. Run. No. Run for us. Too no. Too many accidents happens when when we're running. So no running. Um, I see there are some feature overlap between Terraform and uh, Ansible. Yeah. Can you give some best practices which tasks you uh, give to which tool? Like uh, um, especially setting up a server software and configuring it. Do we this with Ansible it's primarily or better with Terraform? It's a personal thing. So um, I know several people uh, build different templates for different servers. Uh, so that's the first thing where you can start. So you can have a, a different template for, let's say, database servers or web servers. Um, I decided to just start with one template with Packer. Then I went to Terraform. In Terraform, I normally deploy my SSH keys because um, it's not only me who works with the server. Mo uh, more people will work the, with that server, and sometimes a web server needs another SSH key like a database server, so it's, it's a good place to store the SSH stuff there. 
uh, you can already deploy things in, in Terraform. Um, it speaks nothing against it. So um, in, in the moment, I try to move a lot of stuff what I formerly did with Ansible to Terraform, because Terraform for me is the youngest tool, because I started uh, at latest with it. Um, Ansible is, I would say, a software which is used by a lot of people. So there is a lot of stuff around in the internet. You will get a ton of documentation. Um, but from the view of infrastructure as co a code, I would try to get uh, a lot of stuff into the Terraform. Just, yeah. But it, it speaks nothing against it that you remove the shell script provisioner from the Terraform and just point the Terraform to your Ansible. So the, the Terraform task just starts Ansible. So when it's tested, it's, it's perfect. Good question. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Just a second. But no mana left. No. <laughs> Hanuta next time. <laughs> no. I'm quite confident the answer is yes, but uh, other stuff, is there stuff like if then else stuff in, in Terraform? Sorry. Is there stuff like if then else? Tree, uh, there is a what? ton of stuff like uh, if and else you can have um, uh, loops, so you uh, ca can create a single definition file for 10 servers, but just a counter steps up. So there, there's a, a, a lot of stuff. So, uh, yeah, and, and there is if else, as far as I know. Any further questions? You will be around for another half hour, hour, something I, like I that. will be around, I think, the whole evening. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. If yeah. there are no further questions, I would say uh, thank you very much, Steps, and Thanks. another round of applause for Steps, please. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>